live in Odessa, I speak Romanian. I thought that I speak it quite well, but it turns out that I just forgot most of the words. Uh, okay, well, let me, let me, okay, I'll stay here. Uh, but still, uh, if you have question, uh, you can ask in, in Romanian and I will try to answer. Uh, that's the first part. So today we'll be talking about the React Flux Redux. Uh, basically, uh, what I try to do, uh, here's our agenda, is to provide some kind of big picture, like how, um, uh, like what, what is the key history, like what was before the React, uh, uh, how it differs from others, and so on. Uh, plus, we would have the demo, of the few demos of the React, and we would be talking about the flux redux and differences between those architectures. Uh, so let's start with the history overview. Uh, the first thing that it just arrived, uh, it was like pre-spaced digquery stuff. Uh, so before that, mostly people would be kind of doing some small things with the JavaScript, uh, but as soon as jQuery arrived, uh, the UI became more complicated. Uh, you get kind of the abstraction of uh, the events, you get the things that were working in different browsers, uh, you shouldn't care, but still that is kind of pre SPA, it was event based and writing the single page application, it was just a hell uh, with the jQuery. Uh, then actually Big Bone arrived, which says like, okay guys, uh, what we would do, we would do MVC, and basically Big Bone is quite simple, and it's, it's just as simple as that, so basically you have the model, uh, which can get uh, to the server uh, by using the rest. It would uh, throw you some kind of events uh, uh, which you can subscribe with. Then in the controller, which is Bigbone View actually, uh, you just subscribe to events and then you do anything either by changing the existing view of the jQuery or just rendering the full view. Uh, you could change the view template and so on. Uh, plus, there was a Marinette, which Xenia would be talking about, which uh, added some additional value. Then, actually, uh, there would be React. So, React is being much more complicated. That is the framework, unlike everything else, which was a library. Uh, it basically has like a full ecosystem, and it, it is being, I would say, quite complex. So, basically, you have like the models, the filters, and actually uh, the services, factories, providers, and so on. And it was all about the data binding and model view view model framework. So basically the evolution uh, looked like the event-driven application, then we went through MVC, then that was data binding with the model view view model. Uh, but here's the issue. The issue is that some of the things were not solved. And those are basically, the first one is working with DOM. Because uh, basically in all of those frameworks, uh, as soon as you get the performance issues, you starting thinking like, how do I work with DOM? So for the backbone, uh, you'd be thinking like, okay, I shouldn't change DOM that much. I should change it like in more efficient way. Uh, for the Angular, you'd be starting looking for, okay, I don't need like two-way data binding. I need like one-way data binding. Some of the people uh, would be thinking like, I, I'll just do that with the jQuery, just much faster than making that for the digest cycle and so on. Uh, the second thing is that uh, in most of the cases, the front-end application should be reusable. And that is not the case, so you should kind of wrap it that as a component. You should do some kind of things just to share the code that you already have written and put that either in the different project or just change it a bit. And the third thing is the complexity, which also was not solved. So let's talk like what is React and what is uh, kind of it brings. The first thing is that React is library for building QI. It is being open source, developed by Facebook. Uh, so we, initially it was intended just to be the view in the MVC and it can be integrated with other libraries so you can use it for instance with Backbone and so on. And what it tries to solve is just the issues that I outlined which is like working with DOM reusability and complexity. So let's talk about the DOM. Uh, if I go too fast, you can slow me down. <coughs> so. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, the major issue with DOM is that uh, it was not designed for change. If you just remember the initial thing is the page was rendered on the server, it was shown in the browser, and that's it. So that was something that was like in the late 90s. And the document object model is not designed to be changed on the fly. So basically change is being quite expensive, and if you do change it, then actually uh, you have to think like about all the things. Uh, right now, basically, the Shadow DOM standard is being developed. Once it is done, 
um, things would be kind of much better, but still we are living in the real world where we do have complex applications. On one hand, on the other hand, we still should have a way to do that faster. And React solves that by introducing the virtual DOM concept. So what is the virtual DOM concept? Uh, it's just as simple as that. Uh, so uh, React has the memory DOM representation, kind of the current state of the DOM. Uh, then actually when any change is happening, uh, what it would do, it would kind of generate the new and memory version of the DOM, then it would compare both, uh, would find the difference between those both, then it would cal calculate the minimal mutations that should be made just to uh, adjust the DOM and just will apply those mutations. And that is working much faster and is done quite effective, so in most of the cases you would even forget like about how would I work with DOM, what should be done just to make it more effective and so on. Uh, then actually it comes to the reusability. Uh, the first thing that kind of React says is that the, it's all about components. So we would be doing components, we wouldn't be uh, kind of uh, splitting the application into widgets to do something like that. So we are working just with the components and those components contains UI and logic uh, then they do have strict, strict interfaces and they have to be stateless so all the data should come in and depending on the data they should work, they shouldn't remember the state and so on. So my first reaction to the kind of the state that components should contain UI and logic was something like that. Then the next reaction was something like that. So basically let's think about that. So previously everyone told us that we need to think about the kind of separation concerns that there is single responsibility principle that uh, the component itself, uh, basically the JavaScript should have only logic and then there should be the view where we do pass just all the data, it should know nothing about the logic and basically the logic and the view should be kind of just separate. Uh, kind. Yeah, so, and that was just a mess. Uh, but then if we think about that like uh, in more detail, so. The first thing is that Facebook engineers, they are not dumb people. So if they think about that, uh, then actually it could make sense. So what they do say is uh, our components is being quite small, the first thing. Uh, they do have st like strict interface. So instead of uh, having like multiple components, you just keep everything in one place and that stuff is just being dramatically small and easy to manage. Uh, so about the complexity. Um, the way kind of React tackles the complexity is quite simple. So basically your application should be divided into, these uh, into the set of small components. Uh, those actually do have quite strict interface which means that you define like what your components should accept and what it should expect. If the kind of interface is not met that it just doesn't work and that's it. And as soon as you uh, or somebody else just fits the interface, the component work, will work just fine. Uh, then the data should be immutable in the component. Uh, what does that mean? That means that uh, if we kind of get the data from outside, we do not change it. So we, we can actually change the state, we can uh, copy the data, but we do not change the data uh, that comes from outside. And then actually they stayed for the data flow concept. So, uh, what, what, is, what, what it does tell us is that uh, we just define the way data, uh, data comes to our component. So there is actually the link uh, to the Ryan Anklin presentation where he kind of gets into that in more details. So uh, the data flow is just known like in one, one way data binding. Uh, but the, the major issue here is that the data flows just from one side and it cannot be changed by the view. So basically, uh, to change the data, your view should notify the upper component or root component, then actually it applies the changes to the data and that data gets kind of down. So the data always get, gets from the upper component to the uh, lower level component. And that is also known as the unidirectional data flow. So let's make a demo. Yes, that's it. Okay. 
so how the normal flow looks. So for instance, what we need to do, we just need to create the component which will display actually the uh, currency on our, on our side. So the first thing is that we would do, sorry, I'll go for is 6 Is it better? So basically everything in our system is just derived from the React component. And what it does have inside, so in our case we will just make it quite simple, we do have the render method. Uh, which would return something that is called JS6. So let's keep it simple for now, that would be just So, uh, how would we place it in our application? Oh, I already have imported the currency. Just like that. So, what, what has just happened, basically? We do have the application level component, which would be attached to the DOM. Uh, then actually inside, if we do want to kind of reuse anything, then we just import that as a class and put that into the markup. Uh, as a, what, what would happen as a result, basically, is that uh, the JSX would be transformed in the quite simple JavaScript, uh, which would be something like uh, rec, uh, component create like element, let's say D for something that, that is being on top and so on. And that will be kind of uh, generated on the fly. And that is needed just for the virtual DOM again. So let's keep moving. Let's implement another component. Just a second. Uh, so basically, as you can see, that is still being quite simple uh, HTML. Ah, yeah. Uh, then actually we can reuse that component inside of the currency by doing just simple import. And let's make the table look like it should be. Okay, so if we get back to, excuse me? that is just here. <laughs> so, it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay, so, I'm all right. <laughs> okay. 
so basically, we are just uh, included that in the like uh, in our component. Uh, let's go a bit further and just get the current zero. So we are going to pass data here. And here's the first thing. So React actually gets data inside of the props. Uh, so basically, let's say if I want to render something, like in our case, we want to Uh, we want to ren render in that component just the data about the specific currency. Uh, so what we do actually, we just get that from the props. It doesn't like anything. Ah, yeah. Okay, there we go. Uh, so now let's pass out data to the currency. So the way I will do that, like in our case, is I would just simply specify that my component would get the currencies. So I'll pass that into the currency. Then actually to render all the currencies, I would import the currency row. And I will do so I get currencies inside. Oops. Okay, cool. So it seems like we are done, uh, uh, which is not kind of, okay, there we go. So let me run the NPM start. And we will see like why React is being so cool. Okay. Uh, just a second. That's not the correct app. Uh, there we go. Okay, so as, as you can see, actually, I can see the server, but that's the nice thing. So if we get actually to the console, then you'd see that we have warnings. 
And the cool thing about the React is basically it provides you a lot of details what, what is going wrong, starting from uh, if you make an error, it just gives you the exact line where you just make the error. So you do not spend that much time on debugging. The next thing is just uh, states for you to be kind of effective. The first thing is that what I done wrong, I did not specify the key uh, for the kind of collection and React tells me like, hey man, uh, go and do that because otherwise the virtual DOM wouldn't be working as effective. This third thing that is done for me basically, you just told, come on man, uh, you just forget to make your DOM correct. So basically our table, uh, it contains kind of the t head but doesn't have uh, t-body section. So it even validates the DOM for you. And that's also one of the coolest features. So basically, like out of the box, on one hand, you do create kind of small components. Uh, every time when you do actually a mistake, you see the exact reason for that mistake. And like unlike in the Angular way, you sometimes would be able just to see the blank screen with no error messages and you just have to outline yourself like what is going on there. Like in the React, you would, see, you would always see the exact reason for your mistake. Uh, so if I, let's say, for instance, get to the, uh, back to my application, and I'll do something wrong, like for instance, Okay, let me go that way. Okay, there we go. So it just tells me that the currency row is not defined, it is being in the current JS, and that's the exact line uh, where I made the mistake. And that actually saves you a lot of time. So, because basically most of the time when you do work on something, uh, you do not write kind of your code uh, always. You would kind of try to fix mistakes, figure out like what is going wrong and so on. And that part of the React is being really, really cool because it just tells you to be as effective as possible. Okay, let's get farther. Uh, what else is it brings? So basically, it has quite good ES6 support. Uh, that does not mean only that you just add the bubble uh, and you just work with it. That means that uh, what you can do actually, the React has the different life cycle for the ES6. So when you start using ES6, you would have like the different methods that you can use. So for instance, instead of using like get initial state or set initial state, you can go and do that directly in the constructor and so on. Uh, then, then browser compatibility. So for the, like previously it was supporting everything up to IS7. So when you do, uh, when you were writing your app, actually you uh, wouldn't even care about the browsers, how that would work, like uh, what would be the events and so on. So everything up to IS7 was working fine. So for now the, that is like IS8, but I guess that's more than enough for everyone. And then actually the coolest thing that I like is just it fails fast and clear. So you always know what goes wrong. So let's do some kind of sum up on that. Uh, so the first thing is uh, if you have experience, let's say with Angular or something like that, uh, what you have to do, you have to kind of shift the way you think about the application. You should split that into the small, small components. Those components should always be kind of independent, have strict interface, be stateless, and so on. Uh, as a result, actually, what you would get, you would get kind of fast DOM manipulation, so you wouldn't even think or care mostly about the way the DOM change. Uh, so, and that's, I guess, like the coolest feature. Uh, the second one is that you would always uh, kind of have your components reusable, so basically, if you do have the interface and then you want to reuse that, you just import that in the place where you want uh, provide all the data inside and it just works. Uh, then the browser compatibility, uh, unit testable code, because basically Rack has the Jest library, uh, which someone complains about, but it was working quite well basically, but you can test everything, and that is cool. And uh, last but not least is that you can use that uh, with uh, any other libraries like Backbone just to be the view. So you actually uh, can use uh, 
So some guys were using even it with uh, Angular or Backbone and just replacing the view. And that was kind of the first part. The second thing is uh, it's Flux. So like what is Flux and how it appeared? So as soon as Backbone appeared, uh, that actually mean uh, it, it was kind of the view, but the guys wanted to use it fully in the application. Uh, so they kind of declared the architecture, uh, which was designed for Backbone or basic lab, or, sorry, for React or apply to React, uh, which was using unidirectional data flow. And here, the way it looks like. So basically, if you do kind of uh, take a look on the screen, uh, what is happening here? So for instance, when a user does something, we just do not make the change directly. Instead, uh, we would throw an action somewhere uh, and, tell user, and tell that something happened to the system. That action actually will have all the information about what is happening. So for instance, if someone is editing the user, then actually we are just telling like, hey, uh, user edit in our system and here's the, I don't know, his surname, first name, email and so on, like all the data about the action. Uh, then actually there is the dispatcher, uh, which would be kind of the central hub in the system. So it would actually kind of hold uh, like all the actions would go for, the, for those dispatcher. Uh, so as soon as action came to the dispatcher, then actually uh, it would have a set, of, a set of stores that are registered in that dispatcher, and uh, the dispatcher will tell to every store like, hey, that's the action that I get. Uh, if you are interested uh, in it, just go and handle it. And then actually that flow uh, goes smoothly. So I'll skip those parts because we just went through. Uh, but if you're interested, I will send the presentation. It has notes about that. Uh, so, and what it ends up. Uh, the first thing is, uh, like, Facebook provided the kind of guidelines, uh, but there were some kind of issues that uh, everyone faced, and thus actually kind of a lot of libraries appeared. Uh, like for instance, as you can see, there are like top 13 Flux libraries that you can use. They are, they're kind of being a bit different in some of the cases, and all the code is being library specific. Uh, so we will go through that like in more details. Uh, let's take a look at the example of the Flux. Uh, how much time do I have? Uh, it's still only Okay. Okay, good. Uh, now oh, that's Redux. Okay, there we go. So let's take a look at the way our application would look like. So the first thing is the dispatcher. Uh, so basically just as simple as that. So uh, I'm using the Flux library and then I tell that I need the dispatcher in my application. Then actually uh, I... Okay, sorry. Well, I do see it nice on my screen. <laughs> Just a second, sorry guys. <laughs> okay, cool. So let me get, that's the wrong one. Uh, okay, there we go. Uh, so the <coughs> dispatcher is being quite standard. It, it is supposed to be like a singleton in our application. And here's our, our application structure. The first thing is that we do have is the kind of dispatcher, which would be the central hub. Then we do have an action, uh, the actions. So for instance, uh, like we want user to be able to deal with currency, like how would we do that? So we have basically the function which accepts the currency that we want to delete and then it just dispatches the action. Uh, Whereas the action type like delete currency and the currency that we want to delete. Uh, then actually what would happen then? Uh, the data would come to the dispatcher and it would look for the stores. And here we have the store implementation, for instance. The store consists of two things. The first one is basically kind of the interface to work with the data. So for instance, we do have a method which gets like all currencies. 
uh, we do have a method uh, which just deletes the currency. And then actually we create that store and we are registering that store in the dispatcher. So what we are really saying is uh, like that we want to register that function. Uh, that function would be called like when any action happens in the system. Uh, then in case we're interested in that action, uh, we actually handle that. So we are saying like, okay, so delete currency has happened. So we are taking the store, we are saying to delete the currency and that's it. So as soon actually as delete currency happens, what we do, uh, what we are doing also, we are just triggering the change. So we are saying that the data in that store is, is changed. Uh, so the way actually application would react to that is the first thing, let's take a look how the delete currency is called. So we are just importing the actions and we are telling that we want to delete the currency. So the view would just provide the currency to delete. Uh, that actually would go through the dispatcher. Dispatcher would call the store. The store would delete the currency, would raise the change event. And then in the kind of, in the main uh, kind of file, what, what we do, we are just subscribing to the store on change event. And we are saying like, as soon as it happens, uh, we are just changing the state from our view. So basically we are just uh, setting the currencies. Uh, so let's launch the application. Just, there we go. Ah. Like is, it is wrong here. Okay, so as, as you can see, actually, the action can be deleted. Let's implement the uh, add action. So I was not sure like whether we would have enough time, so I just commented the code. So the first thing you do actually is you kind of uh, add it into the actions. You don't want actually everywhere just to include your dispatcher uh, and then know about the action times and so on. So we are just uh, saying that we would add the currency we would provide all the information about the currency and then we would call the dispatcher dispatch. Uh, then the next thing that we want to do is uh, get to the like add currency view that we have. Just a second. Okay, so we do have that method. Uh, what we would do here is we would just call the add currency uh, method and would provide the currency information. The next step would be is that we get to the store, uh, we would just react to the add currency action that happens in the system. And we would call our method which will handle that action. And as a result, it would also trigger the change. So let me start from scratch it. Okay, there we go. Uh, so the flow for the flux would be al always the same. So you are just adding new action to the system. Then you just go and register, uh, kind of call that action. Then you create in the store the method which will kind of implement all the action that is needed. Um, and then actually, uh, you will just register that uh, kind of action, handle, action handler in the dispatcher, and that's it. So it sounds cool, but it does have certain issues. Uh, the first one is that you kind of write a lot of boiler, boilerplate code. So what, what you have to do is just to kind of do the small things, but kind of there are a lot of steps that you always just uh, keep repeating and doing the same thing. Uh, the second thing is that that code is, would be kind of quite specific to the Flux framework that you use. So basically, if you know the Flux, uh, then actually it has a lot of flavors and you have to know about the certain library and so on. Then actually, the major thing uh, kind of is the lightest, uh, lightest one, is that dispatcher cannot dispatch while dispatching. That sounds kind of a bit funny, but that, that is being kind of the most serious issue. Because uh, what is happening? Let's take a look, take another look on the 
applications. So basically, in your application, it just wouldn't be that straight that you, uh, when you do call the action, it just only one thing happens to the system. So normally, what would happen is, let's say, I'm uh, like on the Facebook, you adding the friend. As soon as you do that, what we would like to do, we would like to find someone like in common. So we want to raise like another action. We want to send, let's say, uh, someone mail. We we can do like a lot of things. So basically, uh, once anything happens to the system, that may lead to some other changes that should happen to that system. And in case of the flux, the major issue is that it goes through the view. It has to go because uh, basically the view has raised the action. The action is being uh, kind of went to the dispatcher. But during that period of time, you cannot dispatch anything, uh, which means that your store would handle the first action, then you subscribe to the change from that store, and as soon as that happens, you need to raise like other actions, and your view became quite messy. And you have kind of to think like what, what action happens and so on. Uh, and that's kind of the major issue. So. Let me do the sum up. Uh, okay, probably before I do that, just one more note here. So as a result, actually, what happens is that uh, that's the reason for getting those like top 30 libraries. So most of the people, uh, front-end engineers, it seems like they, they have a chance to either, I don't know, order some Thai food or write the new Flux library. So once you do the Flux, you have to pick the right one. Uh, but it seems like that there is no right one. Because uh, they try to handle it differently. Some, some libraries would have like the second dispatcher. So basically, once you handle the actions, you would put like all the actions in the second dispatcher and that the second dispatcher, as soon as there are no actions in the first dispatcher that it handles, it would push those to the first dispatcher and so on. Uh, but that is actually uh, only to the thing that uh, the ar architecture has the limit. Uh, and uh, as a result, actually, uh, what had happened is the, like, f those, all those libraries raised, like, once, uh, once a lot of libraries we, we created, they just finish with their Redux win. So right now, most of the people would go for Redux and use it, because uh, basically it doesn't have the issues that the Flux has. So it is based on quite simple things. Uh, the first one, uh, so it was developed by Dan Abramov. Uh, it was inspired by Elm, and here like the first, uh, the main principles. The first one is, is you do have one state. So your application always has one state. There is just no sense like in Flux to have different stores which would have different states. So you would always have one state. And that state is being like a single source of truth. You would always be able to see like what data is being in your state and so on. The second thing is that your state is redundantly. So uh, basically that means that your state is being commutable. You cannot change existing state. You would always create the new one. Uh, the third thing is that uh, like everything that you do change, you do change with the pure functions and those functions are being called reducers. So the flow would look like a bit different for you. So you still would have the React as a view layer. Uh, then you'd have something which is called like action creators, uh, which we already see, so basically you just throw the action. And then actually uh, you do have like single store which will keep like all the data. And that store actually would call the reducers and those reducers are just functions that return a new state. And then actually you can have multiple reducers and everything will be combined into one state and your application would be working with. So here kind of the main differences is that right now you do not have kind of multiple stores. Instead every component can be kind of uh, connected to, every component is connected to one store. It, it is dependable like on this set of data and you can identify the set of data a component kind of needs to work with. Then you do have action creators. So instead of actually raising the action inside of the view, uh, that goes just to the view as a function which would be called and that function already knows about the dispatch and so on. And you even don't care like, uh, how that would be handled. And then you do have the reducers which would have quite uh, strict interface. 
So let me get to the reducer. Uh, so those would be kind of pure functions. They would be stateless and they would have the strict interface, which is they do accept the current state, they do accept the action information, and in case they're interested in the handling the action, they would always return a new state. Uh, and what the they to do, it allows to have something that is called time machine. So I'm, I'm sure like most of you hear about that, you can uh, watch the talk uh, of Dan Abramov where he first demoed the time machine. But that was like really, really cool feature. So let me. So let's take a look at the way application, our application looks like. Uh, so we do always have components like we previously had. Uh, then we do have like a store uh, that is being like auto-generated. And normally it would be different for the development uh, and for the production. And the reason for that is that in the development it just applies the middleware which will show you the uh, changes that made to the action. I'll demo that in a second. Then you do have the reducers that you, you're writing. So basically the reducer is look is just as simple as that. So normally uh, it gets the state. Uh, in case the state is not supplied, it uses the default one that you can identify for the reducer just to make sure it doesn't fail. Uh, then actually, depending on the action, what it would do, it would modify the state. Like here, for instance, when we're interested in the currency, edit action uh, or like in the currency deleted action uh, or it would return the state it just get in. Uh, then we do have the actions themselves which, is, which are just pure functions. What, what they do really do is just uh, like in the previous example they say like okay the action that is happened of that type and that is the information about the action that we need to know. And that's actually mostly it. The next thing that you have to do is just the first one. Uh, is you do have something which is called like bind action creators. Uh, that is being standard implementation. So for the actions in my application, what I would do is just I would say like, okay, those are my actions. Just bind that with the dispatch. And then I pass that as a callbacks in my components. So my components just get dump functions uh, they do not nothing. They do not know anything about the Redux, about the way anything works. They just get the functions that they would call and pass the data in those functions, and as a result, those functions will do all the trick. And then, uh, what I would do is I would just uh, add something that is called like connect in the React Redux. So the connect is just the thing that says like what I would like to do. Like as soon as anything changes in the state of currencies, I want to just to render my view. So that's the case. I can pass like multiple uh, changes. So I can have multiple reducers and I can specify that per component. But general practice is that you should have like as more dumb components as possible. You can outline the areas which uh, will have that information, will work with the specific subset of data. Uh, but mostly, mo most of the components would get just pure functions. They wouldn't know anything about Redux. They would know nothing about the whole ecosystem. And that's it. So. How that would work basically is that I specify connect. What I said is like uh, when anything change, just call uh, in the currencies. I want to render my view. That's that part of the code. Then here I just said that uh, what I want to do is as soon as the uh, I want to wrap all the all my actions with the dispatcher. So as a result, I get the list of functions uh, which will be called through the dispatcher. 
Uh, then I just pass them to my components. Then if we just get to the, let's say, our currency row component for the delete action, what it does, it just calls the delete action that come from outside and, pass, and just passes the currency. Then in the re reducer, I'm just having the same thing, so I just uh, react to the action. So in case the currency is added, uh, what I'm doing is, uh, so that is the AS6 uh, code for the getting the new object. So I'm changing the state, so I'll get the new copy of the object. And here in the currencies, uh, I will add the currency and, and I will get like the new copy of the array. So basically the object uh, is not changed. Uh, instead, I would always create new object. The good practice here is to use the immutable library, uh, which actually will guarantee that no one, even by chance, would change the state. But that, that kind of sounds nice, but the best thing that it brings is that thing. Okay, there we go. Let me start doing something. So as you can see on the left, we called, uh, we have, it's not fully visible. Okay, that is much better. So, uh, sorry, on the right, we do have something which is called time machine. What does that mean? Uh, that means that as soon as any action happens in, in the system, basically that is being registered in our uh, kind of uh, store. So we do have list of all the actions. Uh, we can check like what data came for that action, how the state was changed for the action. And the most coolest thing is that we can <coughs> do or undo the actions that happen to the system. So basically at every step, uh, in the system, when anything is changes, you can say, okay, I'm not interested in that. It just redraw. Or like I'm interested. So I can remove that. Okay, what if I just undo that? Uh, what data came here, like in the state? So I do have the currencies. It has like three items. And here's the rate. And what was the action? The action was the like currency. And I get like in the currency pair that one, in the right that one, okay, let, let me undo that, and so on. So the idea here is that once you're developing the application, uh, you would have kind of multiple actions to kind of make the changes to your state. Uh, those actually would be seen here. Uh, you can easily figure out like what uh, part, what reducer has, ch has changed the state and what way and why it has done that. Uh, So I guess that is, that is it. And let me get back to that screen. Like once we've seen the demo, like what would be the main difference is that uh, now actually if you do need to change or create another action as well as you performing the action, for instance, like once we, we we were adding the currency, we would like to like send email. I don't know. I want to notify the system and like do a, any change. We can do that. So uh, our logic is being quite tight. It is being kept not in the view. It is being kept kept actually in the action creators. As soon as like everything is a function and is being stateless, you can reuse that. So basically, that means that you can call like one reducer function in other reducer function, you can call one action in other action. Uh, it's all done with asynchronous support, so basically you adjust all those issues already sorted out. So, and th that is just the way I tried, <laughs> I feel it like when I tried the Redux for the first time for the set of flux. Because basically, uh, you just write much less code uh, you do have cool things for granted, and that's cool. And here are actually the links uh, to the Redux. The most useful one that I encourage you to watch is the last one. So basically that's the lesson which was kind of created by Dan Abramov, uh, the kind of Redux crea creator. And uh, it just covers all the aspects of the Redux. Can you type that? Yeah. So the sum up. So it's still data flow architecture. 
So the Redux is data flow architecture. The thing is that it just introduces limitations to the work, to the way you just work with the states uh, and the way you kind of change it. Uh, the cool thing, uh, which like everyone likes, is that it has time machine. So basically, once you do develop anything, uh, like a lot of actions just happen in your system, and you can you have a way to easily figure out like what actually action made or uh, concrete change. So you can actually see how the action affected your screen, and you can figure out like what exactly needs to be things fixed if anything goes wrong. Uh, the cool thing I didn't demo. Uh, but that's amazing thing. It just supports hot reloading. Uh, what does that mean? That means actually if you, let's say, change your state uh, in a certain way, you can just write your code and without the page reloading, you would see kind of your changes affected on the screen. Uh, that was also being developed partially by Dan Abramov. Uh, it works quite fine. The only thing, it just doesn't work with the latest version of React in case you change the reducers. Uh, but you can actually compose the version that would work quite nice. And the coolest thing is like most of the people, they went outside of the Flux to the Redux because it just in one go uh, sorted out all the issues everyone was trying to tackle uh, uh, by facing the limits of the Flux architecture and they just couldn't do that. And I guess that's it. So questions? I have a question. Okay. What's the place to start with? Uh, what's the learning curve? Uh, well, like the, the thing is that like there is like a lot of noise about the reactor duck. So basically, my kind of uh, presentation consisted of three parts. The first part was the React. So that's the thing you definitely need to kind of uh, know. And it has the link, so you can actually go through. And it is being quite simple. So that, that's the truth. So basically, even if you're getting the details, how it does everything, it is being quite simple. I wouldn't say quite well documented, but still you, you can find everything you need. Uh, the second thing is you just need to know Flux, but for the reason like, why would I never use it? <laughs> it's kind of, so there is something that you can live with in case this is already on the project. Uh, but you always need to think about the actions, uh, about the things that uh, we discussed. So basically, how would I handle uh, the cases when uh, multiple actions should be raised. How would I, uh, like for instance, it just happens uh, on some of the people projects when uh, there is like the loop of the action. So when action A calls action B, action B calls action C, and then action C calls action A, and you just get into the details when nothing happens on the screen and just uh, nothing works. So but, but no general idea. Uh, yeah, but the general idea I would say quite well, but in practicality, doesn't work that great. Uh, so there are also sections with the links and the kind of the coolest thing, I mean like it doesn't have all those issues, it's being Redux. And if you do have possibility to use it, then go for it. And for the Redux actually there is also a set of links, uh, but the last one is being, I would say, the greatest because uh, what the number of did, it just, on the quite simple samples uh, show like all ideas and all the principles that stay behind that framework and cover it, I would say like most of the errors that you need just to start working with. Mm -hmm. uh, why I ask this question? Because there's a lot of hype on the internet. Oh, yeah. everything, React, Flux, Redux, oh, let's, let's do everything. A lot of uh, tutorials, so uh, we can just be overloaded with all, all that stuff. So, well, well, for the React, that would be kind of definitely the documentation, the tutorial. Uh, that's the first thing you need to start. For the Flux, there is also the tutorial and plus the demo apps that you may take a look at. Then actually you can get the kind of links with the top Flux libraries. There are a lot of them, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you need that because basically if you have the Flux on the project, go and study. Uh, if you don't, you need to understand how it works, but not more than that. And for the Redux, uh, that's the... Mm -hmm. um, 
that that is the last link that is being super cool. Okay. Are you using Redux and React in any of your projects? Uh, not in the kind of production one for now. And the issue here is that when we went for the customer, they already have a technology choice. For now, I'm pushing customer to switch to React to Docs, so I'm doing some kind of prototypes uh, with that, and hopefully, I'll manage to do that. Go on. Uh, the benefits pay off uh, if you are trying to migrate uh, medium to large size app from uh, the React to Plus Plus to Redux. Uh, yeah. From what is presented, it would mean basically that you would have to drop the actions to. Uh, correct. So basically, you would have the view part that would be kind of components part that uh, the view part, the render method in the components, which would be mostly unchanged. But the things that you need to change actually is you need to a kind of make your uh, components dump, which means that you need to pass the at the first step you need to pass kind of the callbacks uh, inside of those components. Uh, even if you do flux, then you can extract that and do that in the core components. And then you will have to kind of change the, uh, uh, to change the logic uh, with the way you work with the data in those core components and switch to the Redux. But th there is no kind of easy to go step uh, to switch from the flux to Redux. The, the thing that kind of I'll think about that is that I, I need to make the view layer, I mean the components at the lowest level being unaware of the library and approach that I use, I mean like of the architecture. And to do that, I have the only option which is callbacks. Uh, which means I need to move all the logic to the top compliance. And as soon as I do that, I can adjust those top components to use the Redux. Uh, but that's not kind of an option that you can change it like in one go. It's not really one, and that's the thing. It looks to you like it is being one. Uh, I, I wanted someone kind of to ask that question. It doesn't happen. <laughs> uh, wh what is actually happens is that you uh, you store actually. Oh, sorry. Just a second. Do you see it now? Yes. Okay, cool. So basically what happens here is, there we go. That actually will create you one store. But you can, uh, you can have like as many, not kind of stores, uh, reducers as you want. Uh, you can actually, you write by yourself the way the store is being compound. Uh, and generally, you can have like the few areas which may be aware of different kind of set of stores. Uh, so basically, what would happen is that uh, you would just list, let's say, the reducers that you want to apply, uh, the reducer functions, and then with the connect, it, it actually will unite it and pass that as, as one object to everything. So it looks to you like it is being one object and you have to manage that. But uh, basically, it is not. That, that would be still kind of the small thing and you create and have as many as you want. Okay, I have one more question. Sure. Uh, how do you integrate an external library in a React component? Uh, let's say, for example, for your currency component, mm -hmm. Okay, so if your library doesn't change the DOM directly, then you are fine. So you can use everything that doesn't change the DOM directly. If uh, you do change the widget or anything that changes the DOM, uh, then actually you kind of screwed up. You, you'd have to write that yourself. So that, that's the true of life. 
uh, or you can you can find the alternative uh, which is written in React. And the, re the reason for that is that you do have the virtual DOM. And as soon as basically is anything that tries to change DOM directly, it just wouldn't work. So you cannot use anything that changes or tries to change DOM directly. Uh, un unlike kind of that, if that doesn't happen, you can easily use that with the React infrastructure. And another thing is that you do have a lot of components of the React components, I would say even too much of them, because uh, some of them are not stable, some of them are not working quite well, uh, but still you can find the alternative in the React war world for you. Yes, but you can do that step by step. That's another thing, because what is happening is that React can integrate smoothly into the existing application. So you can actually just make the part of your application being React and just rewrite it part, part by part. Because basically what React needs is just the DOM element it should integrate with. As soon as you just provide that DOM element, uh, then you can have like all the infrastructure working from outside, uh, just fine and not knowing that there is the React and vice versa. Yeah, but oh, yeah, that, that is one. that is not kind of recommended approach as far as I know. For a payment gateway, for example, there's mm -hmm. no way you can have it in React because it has its own IP. We're using a we're using a JavaScript library mm -hmm. for the payment gateway mm -hmm. API component, and that's actually dangerous because there's no other way. Well, yeah. No, it's architecture. It defines your arch architecture. So you yeah. basically, or do you think that that's now a framework, the combination? And if it is, uh, can you also in, so in large application or medium to large application, does React alone make sense? So basically it does. Uh, the idea here is that uh, you can use React separately. So you can have it, let's say, integrated with Backbone quite easily and just be responsible for the view layer. And what you would get is the benefit of virtual DOM basically in cha changing the DOM quite fast. Uh, so you, you can use that directly. Uh, with the Redux, as you mentioned, yes, it becomes the architecture and it becomes more the framework because basically you are limited to the way you're working and to the way you write your code. But you can use those kind of separately. The thing is that uh, right now it is being kind of mostly used in the combination. And uh, like there are projects where they do use, let's say, React with the backbone, uh, but once, once they start a project from scratch, they are trying to get to the kind of React Redux, so basically to use the React with some kind of data flow architecture, which is, it is designed for. Uh, I wanted to make that explicitly. So I want to just to make sure, make sure like everyone sees that. Okay, uh, seems like we are running out of time. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>